What's going on YouTube? It's Teej back again with another video and today we're here to talk about the Indianapolis Colts in our Fix the Franchise series. They hold the number four overall pick therefore they are the fourth team that we're going to talk about. Hopefully you guys enjoyed today's video and if you're new around here want to see more football content, more draft coverage in specific, be sure to hit the big red subscribe button down below and tell me what you think about the Indianapolis Colts this offseason. What moves should they make and in specific let me know who you think ends up being the quarterback under center next year for Indianapolis. It does sound like they're going to go uh, with the rookie quarterback route and, and and utilize this draft class versus going veteran but if you see it the other way i'd love to hear why and who you think it ends up being uh right now i'm thinking you know they're probably the team that moves up to one to get bryce young but that or will levis will levis for some reason feels like a future indianapolis colt but let me hear what you think about the colts and what they do this offseason Let's go ahead and start talking about Indy. Uh, obviously, 4-12-1, uh, not a very good season last year. Frank Reich uh, starts the season as the head coach, obviously does not finish the season in that same position. They bring on uh, Jeff Saturday to be the interim head coach. Also, uh, if you're seeing this maybe a little future on in the future or later on in the future, there has not been you know an announcement for the head coaching hire. Uh, I plan on doing a video uh, about all that next week unless you know news starts to break. But as of right now, they're just conducting interviews, including one with Coach Saturday, uh, if you want to call him that. But um, yeah. So still a little undecided on where this team's going to be going based off that head coaching hire. So that does you know change the direction a lot of this could potentially go in. But nonetheless, also holds seven first or excuse me seven draft picks, including uh, the number four overall pick. Uh, but I do feel like they are a prime contender. Them and Carolina stand out to me as the teams. Most likely to move up to number one and trade with Chicago. So those seven picks may become six, maybe five. Uh, if they move from four to one, I think it's, you know, this year, next year's first, this year's, next year's second. And then depending on how many teams are in on that number one pick, it could certainly be even more. So, uh, Seven picks right now, that could certainly change here in the near future. Uh, tenth right now in the NFL when it comes to cap space. I'm going to pitch a couple things to free up even more, but right now, a little over $20.5 million. So some money to spend and, and some moves to be made there. Uh, looking at free agency, I wanted to start by talking about a couple contracts that I think they can purge. Obviously, Matt Ryan, um, you know, whatever he wants to do with his playing future is up to him. I could see him wanting to retire, and this changes the cap number even more if he does retire, or if it's just a straight release, um, then I, I think, based off my math, it would be about $17 million freed up which would certainly go a long way and help this team a good bit and this is one especially if you're a Colts fan I'd love to hear your input Grover Stewart who you know is kind of a nice run defender had some ups and downs and you know coming off one of the more disappointing seasons in his career in my opinion even when you look at the pro football focus grades a little bit of a down season but uh, if you move on from him Again, by my math, nine almost nine and a half million dollars uh, saved up in cap space. So, if you're a Colts fan, is Grover Stewart one of those defensive linemen that you know, hey, hey, maybe the PFF grade doesn't capture it all? What he does as a run defender is worth that money, or if it's like, yeah, not nah, let's move on from this guy and let's use that nine and a half mil somewhere else. I'd love to hear your input on that. But when I look at that contract versus the production, it feels like a, a likely cap casualty. So those two moves, you're, you're talking about freeing up almost $27 million in cap space, which would certainly be awesome for this squad and put them up to almost $47.5 million worth of spend, which I think there's some uh, some ways to spend that, including Mark Davenport. Like, it's hard to find a, a good logical landing spot for Davenport. And if you're a Colts fan, again, let me hear what you think about Davenport being that potential edge opposite of Quiddy Pay. Um, you know, he's still young, going to be 26 if memory serves, but right there in his mid-20s. Uh, and has had years of being a very, very high-level edge defender. Uh, but this year, obviously disappointing because, you know, when you look at the box score stats and you see one sack, it's like, all right, how am I going to, you know, how do I justify spending big money on this edge rusher when he's coming off a one sack season? Um, but maybe you could, you know, kind of convince yourself that, hey, that was by far his worst year. Look at the year before and then two years prior to that. And there is a guy in his mid-20s that we want to continue to invest in. And maybe his best football is still ahead of him. And, and furthermore, it just been a problematic area for the Indianapolis Colts. How many day two picks has Chris Ballard in, in Indianapolis spent on trying to find an edge rusher? They finally spent a first rounder with Quiddy Pay, and I still think there's something to be you know worked on there. And I still think there's potential to be tapped into. But high level athlete, especially with that three cone. I remember he ran that uh, the Devils three cone six 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 time, and I was like, yep, yeah, this dude coming off the edge is going to be a freak. And he still has that twitchy athleticism, but right now much better run defender than he is a pass rusher. So still work to be done there. So maybe signing a guy who is still young and still has potential, uh, you know, on the horizon and, and still better football to be uh, reached, maybe that's the route. Maybe that's the alternative, and you spend a little bit on Marcus Davenport as opposed to having to use the fourth, you know, fourth overall pick on someone like a Will Anderson. Obviously, when you still need a quarterback, right? So uh, I think Davenport could be the option of 
presenting some upside uh, and finding, you know, someone who's still young-ish could fit with a future winning window of the Indianapolis Colts and kind of put to bed the concerns they've had uh, having to draft edge rushers and it just unfortunately hasn't really worked out. But that important obviously comes with a lot of risk, of course, like I said, coming off a of one-sack season and, you know, you look at New Orleans, and that's that's a team that's been able to have a steady, healthy rotation of edge rushers. Does that play a factor in it? That being said, you see Trey Hendrickson leave New Orleans and go to Cincinnati and continue to be a fantastic player. I think that bodes for confidence, maybe uh, investing in Mark Davenport. But again, if you're an Indianapolis Colts fan, I'd love to hear what you think about a potential Davenport signing. And of course, the contract's going to be a big part of it. If it feels like you get them on a, deep, a cheap deal, like if they somehow got them for, I don't know, 10 flat a year, 10 million a year, you'd be looking at that contract and be like, yeah, that's pretty awesome. But if it balloons into this 20 plus million dollar a year contract because he is young and there is upside, then it's like, okay, that's that's a little harder to justify. So of course, the contract will uh, dictate how we view this pretty heavily. Uh, and I also want to see them add an, a veteran edge rusher, right? Like so many... Uh, Super Bowl contending teams have a rotation of three edge rushers, right? Like when when the Bills had Von Miller healthy, it was him, it was Rousseau, it was you know Boogie Basham, and, and you look at the Bengals, and it's it's sample, it's Osai backing up the guys like Hendrickson and Hubbard. So uh, just using a couple examples there of, of the teams I'm going to be watching later on as I'm recording this, but um, you know finding that third edge rusher and Melvin Ingram, I think makes a ton of sense. He's kind of been this guy who's forever linked as a potential edge rusher for the Colts, uh, and here as he's getting up there in age, I say we cut back the size of his role. He, he, you know, plays 400, maybe 500 snaps a year, and he's kind of that DPR. And I still think, even in Miami, he's kind of showcased. Still got some juice left. And even when Pittsburgh, you know, initially signed him, he had some good games early on. Then he wants to trade, and he kind of shows a little bit of something in Kansas City. So he always has that little bit, you know, he's still got some juice left in the tank. And I think by cutting down his role, you'll be able to see that more and more frequently and just kind of put him out on the field when you absolutely need him. And then you could be talking about, you know, an edge rush trio of Quiddy Pay, former first-round pick, Mark Stavaport, former first-round pick that a team traded up two first to go get um or traded an additional first round to be able to go get him and then melvin ingram who has had this long successful career and kind of continued to linger around the league because he's still got a little bit left in the tank so all of a sudden that edge rush group feels like it fully comes together there for indianapolis and that takes us into the nfl draft um you know if you did all that work in the offseason you freed up those contracts and then signed those two edge rushers and then found a way to get your qb1 to me, this is a win of an offseason for the Colts. Yeah, there's other areas where they can get better, but if they solidified what that edge rotation is going to be and got their future franchise quarterback, I'd be pretty happy if I'm a Colts fan. Uh, so for me, you know, it just comes down to, is Bryce Young that number one guy? Because if so... You you don't want to write a blank a blank check, right? Like you don't want to, you know, give up the farm just for one guy. But when it comes to trading up the NFL draft, quarterback's the only position you can about justify for why you would give up more swings to the bat, right? Like quantity in the NFL draft is king. You want as many swings to the bat as possible. You want as many chances, uh, quantity over quality in a lot of ways. Now, you know, there comes with a little bit of a blur, like the top of this draft, you know, the quality for like a, like an Arizona at three, that quality of getting a Jalen Carter or Will Anderson might be enough to entice you away from the quantity of however many picks you might be able to get from trading down from three. So just using the Cardinals as an example there. And the Colts are kind of an interesting spot here where you could sacrifice that quantity if like, yeah, Bryce Young is our guy. That's our QB1. We need... And this feels like also a roster that, and I've said this a handful of times, that has had this Andrew Luck size hole right in the middle of it just because of how surprising that, you know, retirement was when Luck did step away from the game. And Frank Reich was hired to kind of fully take this offense to the next level with Andrew Luck, and then boom, he's gone. So this could be the spot where it's like, hey, we're going to go ahead and fill that, fill that hole with our franchise guy. So if that's Bryce Young, I think this is green lights. Let's go. Let's make that move. Uh, yes, it does mean you're going to give up a ton for him. But if you see Bryce Young in that light, I think this roster the rest of the way is in a pretty healthy spot and a pretty good spot. And if you do draft it, a Bryce Young, you're talking about having some solid wide receiver talent with a Michael Pittman Jr. and Alec Pierce. We'll figure out what they're doing with that third receiver. Offensive line on paper still solid. I know it was not as fantastic this past year, but still a pretty good unit in my opinion. Jonathan Taylor, you got a really good running back there. And the defense on the other side has some superstar talent. And, and you know, hey, you get Kenny Moore, the guy on your screen, playing back to where he was throughout you know, every year in his career leading up to this past season. Hey, that's a superstar piece in the secondary. You have Shaq Leonard coming back, ideally healthy, and hopefully at 100%, but you also have Bobby Okereke with a big year. Uh, you still have DeForest Buckner. Hopefully, Quiddy Pay takes that forward, and if they do follow my free agency plan, then, you know, that edge rotation is set. This is a team that can win now, so I think if you see Bryce Young in that light, go get him. Or if they see, you know, Will Levis in that light, you might be able to stick and pick here at four, but maybe it's swapping places with Houston then, so 
position yourself in the draft board wherever you think you can get that quarterback one. Um, and there's still a whole lot of this process left to be played out. I am fascinated to see where this all kind of comes together because, you know, right now I have Levis over Stroud, but there's a lot of people, you know, <laughs> who want to uh, let me know their opinion. They, they think Stroud better than Levis. And I respect you for it. That's your opinion. I can totally get behind that. And I almost wonder with a little bit of time, do we get a little bit of Trevon Walker and uh, Aiden Hutchinson type of treatment with this quarterback class, right? Can like one of these, you know, CJ Stroud, maybe because of the size or Will Levis because of the upside and the traits preserve, uh, looking like they're there uh, and coming from a bad ecosystem, maybe he can be unlocked to NFL level. Can, can a team kind of talk themselves into one of those guys and usurp uh, Bryce Young as that number one quarterback in this class. I'd be fascinated to see if that actually does come to fruition. Right now, I, I still think it's Bryce Young as QB1 and it's pretty safe in that. So again, if you're the Colts, go get him at one. But whoever they see as their QB1, it'll be interesting to see how they position themselves on the board. Hey, we like Levis. We can just get the two and we feel comfortable with getting him there. Or hey, we like Stroud. Let's go get to number one because we think, hey, there's an outside shot. Somebody else wants to take him at one. So I am really fascinated to see how that stock uh, kind of plays out through that, throughout the rest of this process over the next four months. Anyways, obviously, go get your quarterback one. That's that's kind of a, 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 an obvious point here when talking about the Indianapolis Colts. Uh, but then if you don't attack edge and free agency, this is a really deep edge class. So uh, probably not going to be able to do it at four because, again, I think quarterback is the focus there. But they're in the second round, uh, depending on you know what you might trade and they move up potentially to get that quarterback. That could certainly be an area that you attack. But even, you know, rounds three, round four, I think there's some guys who could potentially work themselves into a rotation. It may not be right away starters, but could be guys who make an impact pretty soon and pretty early on. Also a deep corner class. So, um, you know, I think they got some solid play. And Stephon Gilmore continues to be a really good player. And I do believe Kenny Moore will bounce back. Uh, you know, Isaiah Rogers was a nice story uh, there on the outside. So maybe corner is at their highest priority right now. But I think they could add some depth there. Uh, and then I think safety specifically if they use Rodney McLeod, who played a ton for them this year and actually played pretty well in my opinion so if they lose McLeod I could see safety being another area they want to attack and then later on you know uh, this may not be the most impressive wide receiver class not like what we've seen basically the last three years but there is a potential to find you know a uh, Paris Campbell replacement uh, maybe a Nathaniel Dell from Houston it, it, I think of him probably as a late day two guy so maybe they could nab him in the third maybe he falls to day three and then get him in the fourth but someone like that 5'10 165 pounds that's a whole lot of the same stuff that Paris Campbell uh, does could be a satellite guy work him in space and get the ball out to him quick let him be yards after the catch weapon but also a lot of downfield speed uh, over 100 catches almost 1400 yards at Houston so Nathaniel Dell could be that guy and that's just one name maybe Jalen Hyatt it's a faller or something like that. So uh, trying to find that Paris Campbell replacement, I think, would pay dividends because then you're talking about having a young wide receiver core in place for years to come with Pittman, Pierce, and whoever that third ends up being. But to kind of round things out, had a long tangent there in the middle about quarterback. But, I mean, that's that's the focus. That's, that's what this offseason comes down to for Indianapolis. If they do nothing else but get a future franchise quarterback, move up to one and get Bryce Young, that's a win in the offseason, right? Because then it's like, okay, now this was the team I picked to win the AFC South last year. So now it's like, okay, now we're back on track. We can continue along with where we should be. And of course, the head coaching hire is going to be an important one too. You can't go out there and you know have an Urban Meyer type of situation, totally derail any type of move you make this offseason. Because we've even seen when you draft a you know future franchise quarterback, an elite prospect at number one, but you get the head coaching hire wrong, you know things go sideways. To use the Jags, a team in the same division as an example. Uh, but you know to kind of nail us home, they could nail everything else, right? Like they could go sign Davenport. They could go, you know, re-sign Rodney McCullough. They could do all these things that make Colts fans happy. But if they don't get the quarterback decision right, or you know, they, you know, I don't know how they mess it up, but they mess it up at the top of the draft, then this offseason is just, you know, kicking the can down the road and waiting another year, and, and we'll have to go to another offseason in a year's time, saying, you know, what are the Colts doing to the quarterback? So of course, the man under center is the number one priority, and the number one thing we have to wait and see what the Colts do and what route they take. That, and of course, the head coaching hire. But let me know what you think about the Indianapolis Colts down below in the comment section. Do you think Grover Stewart is a the guy they should move on from? Who in free agency should they attack? Do you like the Marcus Davenport signing, and who ultimately should be QB one on the Indianapolis Colts draft board? I'd love to hear your takes and who you think would be a good fit for Indianapolis. So let me hear your thoughts. Down down below in the comment section. But that's going to do it for me. Hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day. And until next time, my name is Teach, and I'm signing off.